الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We begin today with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the tawfiq min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the ability from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembering some of those great personalities who laid down the foundation of our religion and preserved it for us and from them we find a spectrum of ethnicities and backgrounds meaning sometimes people start to think Islam is just for a particular race or a particular people or a particular region but that's not true Islam is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah chose as the only religion for all of mankind so black, white, brown, Asian, Arab, Ajam, rich, poor, Islam is the only way of success. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a Nabi to every nation. And He sent the Nabi to speak in the language of that nation. Ma arsalna rasulin illa bi lisani qawmihi. We did not send a messenger to a people except in the language of the people. And this is very important because when we look at a religion that is a universal truth, it has to be a religion that is universally applicable. Jazakallah khair. Meaning that if you take a religion that is only for a certain people, a chosen people, for example, then it cannot be binding on people that would not be from that race. Meaning if you say that God's people are only the Israelites, then what about the Chinese? What about Africans? What about Native Americans? What about, what about those people? If God was of a certain ethnicity, and some people say God created man in his image, and he was a white guy with blonde hair and blue eyes, then what about black people and Asian people? How would that be fair? But Islam is a religion of beauty. Islam is a religion of truth. So Allah doesn't have an agenda. He doesn't have a race. He doesn't have... We don't say Allah is Mexican or Allah is Chinese. Na'udhu Billah. That's nonsense. Huh? And Allah chose from His ibad, from His slaves, from His worshippers of different races and made them prophets. So there were prophets that were black. There were prophets that were white. There were prophets that were other races. And just like that, Allah chose people of different backgrounds to be the Sahaba, to be the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Prophet وسلم, he's Arab, he's from Banu Hashim, from Quraysh. But around him, from the earliest Muslims, you will find people of different ethnicities. And here Imam al-Dhahabi, the great scholar in his amazing works, Yar Alam al-Nubala, he writes, Qala Mujahid, the great Tabi'i, early scholar, Faqih and Mufassir, Mujahid, he said, أول من أظهر الإسلام سبعة. The first to make apparent their Islam were seven. Mujahid says the earliest. Now again, in the early time, there were people that became Muslim, but their Islam was secret. Why? Because of the oppression, because of the murders and killing of Muslims that went on in Mecca. Like we see what happened with Sumayyah and Yasir, رضي الله عنهما, and what we see with the torture of Khabbab and Bilal radiallahu anhuma. So many people, they kept their Islam secret. And many, it was not in the public eye. Like Khadija radiallahu was the first Muslim, but she was at home, she was a woman. She didn't deal with people, so it wasn't something that really caught the eye of Quraysh. But there were those that were open about their Islam, and the earliest of them, according to Mujahid, were seven, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, from day one he was open with his Islam. And Bilal, Bilal radiallahu anhu, as well known, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, and he mentioned Ammar in some of the rawayat with Yasir, his father, and Sumayya, his mother, and Suhaib. Suhaib here is the one we're going to be talking about today. He's well known as Suhaib ibn Sinan al Rumi. He's called Suhaib al-Rumi even though he's actually not ethnically Roman. And we'll, we'll explain why he's called Suhaib al-Rumi. His kunya, his nickname as you could say was Abu Yahya. Even though he has no son named Yahya. 
So why was he called the father of Yahya? We will explain as well, inshallah. His actual name is Suhaib ibn Sinan ibn Malik ibn Abdul Amr. Abdul Amr, and we know Amr is not one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but because they were mushrikeen at that time, they would have Abdul Muttalib, for example, denoting a slave, even Abdul Muttalib was not a slave, but the nephew, but yani, denoting servitude to other than Allah, because he's the name of the mushrikeen. He was born to a royal family, you could say. Not necessarily kings, but governors. His father and his uncle were governors in what would be current day Iraq. And at that time, they were aligned with the Persian Empire. So the Arab at that time had no kingdom. The Arab before Islam, they had nothing. Yani, they were Bedouins, they had tribes, they had Qabail. But they didn't really have a kingdom in the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi was sent with the Risala, with the messenger of Islam. So at that time, the Arabs were divided in their alliance. Some aligned with the Persians, which were a superpower, the people of Faras, and some aligned with the Romans, like Banu Ghassan and others, and they were aligned with the Romans, who were also a superpower. And the fight was between these two, the Persians and the Romans. They would go at it with each other in a very cruel way. But the Arab were kind of just in the middle. Some would go this way and some would go that way. His uncle and his father were governors on behalf of the Persians. So they were at odds with the Romans. The Romans, they attacked a Persian village where he was there. Some of the ulema of tariq said he was with his own mother. Some of the ulema said he was actually with a, a woman from the Bedouin tribes that was uh, suckling him and raising him. As the Arab, their tradition used to be, they would send their little children out with the Bedouins to kind of learn the ways of the Arab. Either way, at around five years of age, he was kidnapped by the Romans. The Romans attacked that area, and the Romans were very cruel. So when they would attack an area, they would kill off the people. And the area was under Persian control, so the Romans had and he a bone to pick with them. So when they attacked them, they killed off the men, and they took women, ones that they wanted to keep, some of them they were killed as well, and they took the children as slaves. So now, even though he's born in a house of royalty, not knowing who he is, they took him as a slave, the Roman Empire. And they took him back to what was the center of Rome at the time. And this is why some of the ulema said this was actually in Constantinople, not Rome itself. But it's called a Rome. That whole empire was called a Rome. Now here, as a child, he went through a lot of hardships. He was about five years of age when he was kidnapped, and he was treated very harshly, as he explains himself. He was sold from slave master to slave master under the Romans, who would beat him, who would be very cruel to him, and they would force the Christian religion upon him. And he said, and some of his own writings, he said, I, 20 years he spent, amongst the Romans. So five years old when he was there, 20 years he spent there. So his Arabic, even though he was of Arabic descent, it was messed up, like he couldn't speak Arabic properly. He learned the Roman languages for Greek and Latin. He was fluent in them, but his Arabic was weak. And he tried to keep his identity, but he didn't know much about the Arab world. I mean, he was five years old when he was kidnapped. And the Romans, when they forced their ideology, their religion upon him, he never felt comfortable with it. He said it never made sense. When they would talk about Jesus being God and so on, and uh, crucifixion and all of that, it never felt right to him. And you will find many people, our brother Tommy is here, mashallah, today, who just accepted Islam yesterday, and we were just talking earlier about the same thing. And that's something wonderful when you see somebody become Muslim, and then you see them in the masjid with us, alhamdulillah. Huh? That when you have that idea of Christianity and Catholicism forced down your throat, it still never makes sense. You're never comfortable. You just kind of like blindly accept it. You're told, you know what, just shut up and believe. Blind faith. It's a mystery. It's a mystery of the Trinity. You know, like, like all these slogans to make you not think. While Islam is a religion that encourages us to tadabbur, to contemplate. Because it's, it has to do with fitrah, what meets the human nature. Because Allah has put that seekness of truthfulness in our hearts. So here, 
As Suhaib al-Rumi, he always wanted to know about God and the Creator and the purpose of life and what he was told of the Christian religion didn't make sense to him. But he was a slave in Rome, so what could he do? So he says at that time, he was with one of the slave owners, a Roman Christian slave owner. And another came to him to speak to the slave owner, but Suhaib al-Rumi could hear them. He could hear their conversation as he was serving them. And the, the one that came to visit his master was a priest. And not only was a priest, but he was somebody who would do fortune telling. In Islam, our ulama, are, it is haram on us to deal with fortune telling. We don't tell people's palms, we don't, we don't write magic spells and all that is bid'ah. You know when they say, oh you want to get married, we're going to write you a little ta'weez and, and now you're going to get married. This is not from the sunnah. If that's the way to get married, then Rasulullah would have taught it to us. Somebody has a problem with their husband, their wife, they go, they say, write me a ta'weez so that my husband can divorce me or, or he can leave me or marry me or whatever. This is all not from the sunnah. These are things people have made up. But the Christian priests used to indulge in a lot of things that would be against even pure monotheistic religions altogether, let alone Islam. So they would deal with fortune telling, they would deal with uh, checking the stars and all those kinds of things, even though it was against the, the, the rules that the church had even set. And that's why you find many of these abbots and priests and bishops wrote in this subject of fortune telling, and you can find their writings. So this man, from his own scripture, from the Christian scriptures that he had, and from what he saw, from this haram way, which is not halal for us, but this is the way he used it, of fortune telling, he said that I see that the time of the last prophet is coming. That the last prophet that's going to be sent by God. Now sometimes Christians ask us, where, where is Muhammad in the Bible? Before we give our own opinions, go look in your own books. <laughs> You see this man, he was a Christian. And he found in the Bible that he had in his time with him, the reference that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is coming. So Suhaib al-Rumi said that at that time it triggered my interest that somebody is coming who's going to be the last Prophet. And that man, he said that that man when he comes, he will put an end to the injustice. And he will bring justice from God like the earlier Prophets brought justice from God. And Sahib al-Rumi, he loved this idea and he had this want to find the truth in his heart. But he had no means. And he was in Rome as a slave, he, had no, he couldn't go. But see, whoever wants to know the truth, Allah will make a way for them. You know, sometimes people tell us, what if somebody uh, doesn't accept Islam, but they were really good people and they have the love for Islam, they had love for Allah in their heart, but they just never became Muslim, what about them? Without getting into that issue, I can tell you this from experience. From experience that whoever wants to know the truth, Allah will make a way for them. Even if we don't see it, Allah will make a way for them. His brother sitting here, nobody went and spoke to him. He went on YouTube, saw our videos, he's here. Allah made a way for him. Huh? Many brothers sitting here that became Muslims, you will see that they had no ways. They had no logical way to find Islam. Allah made a way for them. People, I, I, we had an email from Finland. Finland! A guy in Finland watched our videos from the OMF channel and became Muslim. Allah made a way for him. So here Suhaib rumi even though he had no way, but he had that want to follow the truth. He had that talab, that want for the haqq. So Allah made a way for him. He was bought by Banu Kalb. He was one of the Arab tribes. And he ended up being sold again to Abdullah ibn Jud'an. Abdullah ibn Jud'an was not a Muslim. Abdullah ibn Jud'an, we discussed him in the Sirah Durus a little bit. But he was before Islam, before the Risala of Rasulullah sallallahu Obviously the religion of Islam has been the religion of Allah since Adam a.s. But the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu before that time, Abdullah ibn Jud'an was an Arab. And he was a man at a time who was very desperate. He used to try to be a good person. But because he was in debt, heavily in debt, and he felt ashamed of not being able to pay the debt, he wanted to commit suicide. But he didn't want to just kill himself because he found that to be cowardly. So he said, I'm going to go 
and I'm going to go to the desert, and there are many vicious animals in the desert, and I'm going to let one of them eat me. So that I'm not killing myself because that's cowardly, but at the same time, I'm going to be free of this debt because he, he felt ashamed that he owed people money. I mean, even though he wasn't a Muslim, he had that ghira where he didn't want to be in debt. So he went out to the desert and he was looking for, you know, whether in the desert they have their own scorpions and snakes and some desert areas have jackals and, uh, you know, some of the Arab, they would have hyenas and so on, up to lions and things. But he didn't find anything except he found a snake, a red snake. And when he saw the snake, it looked like a proper poisonous desert snake. He said, okay, I'm just going to go to the snake. I'm going to let it bite me and it's going to kill me. And those people that I owe money to when they see me dead, they will know that, okay, he's dead. So he went and he got close to the snake, but the snake didn't move. Until he got to the, the, the hole where the snake was sticking out of and he put his hand there and he jumped himself and out of his own fear, but the snake didn't bite him. Then when he pulled, he realized it's not a real snake. It was a dummy. And he found that this was a place where there was treasure. Imam al dhahabi ibn Kathir and others have mentioned this. Some of the other a'imma, they mentioned that this was the qubur, the grave of the kings of Jurham, the earlier kings. And they had buried a lot of their treasures with them. But at any rate, what we find from Sahih narrations is that he found wealth, gold and silver and other forms of wealth. And he took it back with him. Now in Islam, we have our own ahkam if you find these things. But again, this is before the risala of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he wasn't a Muslim. So what he did is he paid off his debts. And on top of that, he became one of the richest men amongst the Arab, all the gold and silver. And he started to do tijara, trade, business. And his business flourished. And he became very generous. He was known for his generosity. He used to help the travelers. He used to feed the hungry. He used to take care of the needy. He would give to the poor because he realized that he didn't have anything. And now that he was given this wealth, he would spend it generously. He died before learning about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiyanha in a hadith in Sahih Muslim. She asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Ibn Jud'an that he was known for his hospitality and establishing the ties of kinship and feeding the hungry and poor. Will that help him on the day of judgment? He died on kufr. He worshipped idols, but he was very generous. Here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told him no. Told Aisha radiyanha no. He said because he never in a day said that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah to help me on the day of judgment. He never had the niyyah for the reward from Allah. So it will not benefit him on the day of judgment. And that's a very important, I mean, this is kind of going away from the story of Suhaib, but it is related. But that's a very important thing for us today. If we do something for show, we'll get the show of it. If you do something so people can praise you, you'll get the praise. If you do something so you can have a certain status, you'll get the status. But you won't have anything in front of Allah. And then what's the benefit in the end? You want to make somebody look bad, you can do it. You want to make yourself look good, you can do it. You want to make yourself popular, you can do it. You want to become rich, you can do it. But in the end, if you didn't do it for the sake of Allah, then on that day of judgment, you will have nothing. And there are many ayat and ahadith and stories we can mention, but that is just a, a side note for us to benefit from. Abdullah ibn Jud'an was now the owner of Suhaib al-Rumi. And he included Suhaib al-Rumi in his business. And Suhaib al-Rumi flourished in that business. Abdullah ibn Jud'an died. But he had freed Suhaib al-Rumi and made him a partner. So now he wasn't just a slave, he actually owned his own business. And his business flourished. And he was in Mecca. And he was from the richest people in Mecca, even though he wasn't from Quraysh. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam began his da'wah, when he started to call people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah revealed the Qur'an to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, now at this time, Abdullah bin Jud'an is dead. Suhaib al-Rumi is rich and he hears about this last Prophet. And he hears about the Qur'an. 
and immediately it reminds him of what he had heard in Rome. And he has that want to know the truth. So he goes out to find out about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he says, who is this man who I'm hearing about? So they tell him, this is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah alayhi salatu salam. He said, is that the one that's famous in Mecca for being truthful? They said, yes. So is he the one that people keep their trust with because he's so trustworthy? They said, yes. He said, then he must be a man who's speaking the truth. I need to go hear it. Now, this is very early on in the da'wah. This is before Umar ibn Khattab became Muslim. This is before Hamza radiallahu anh became Muslim. Very early on. So when he goes to the house of Darul Arqam, the place of Arqam, he sees Ammar. Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhuma and he there as well. Now Ammar radiallahu anhu is also there to find out about Islam because he also has that love to find the truth. And Suhaib radiallahu anhu is also there to find out about Islam but they don't know each other well enough to trust each other. And they know that the Quraysh if they find out that you are trying to listen to the message of Islam the message of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam they will torture you they will possibly kill you. Right? And neither one of them has tribal backing. So you know, for Abu Bakr radiyan, he had his tribe that backed him. For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was backed by Banu Hashim. Abdul Muttalib and then Abu Talib, they backed him. And you had, for example, Umar radiyan, he had his qabila. But Ammar ibn Yasir had no tribal backing. And Suhaib ibn Rumi had no tribal backing. So if they got caught in this situation, then the Quraysh would torture them and nobody would stop it. So they both kind of looked at each other like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and they're like, well, what are you doing here? You know? They kind of were at that. And then they kind of came out and were like, look, I, I want to know about this message of this man, Muhammad I want to know if it's true. And they said, it was me too. So they both went in and they heard the da'wah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself and they both accepted Islam. And they both made their Islam apparent. They came out with their Islam, even though they knew that there would be hardships upon them. Ammar radiyan, who as we know, his father Yasir and his mother Sumayya radiyallahu anhum, his parents were both killed. And Ammar radiyan was tortured through great tortures. And Suhaib radiyan, who because he was rich and he had yani, some business connections, he kept away from being tortured and killed that bad, but they put restrictions on him. They didn't allow him to sit with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They didn't allow him to move freely. Here, the mushrikun, the people of shirk, they tried to play a trick. And when they saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he saw his followers being Bilal, and Khabbab, and Suhaib, who were not people of high lineage. They were not people of status. See, there were the leaders like Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, who's called Abu Hikam by them. These were people that were honored. Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, became Muslim later. These were respected people. Bilal radiyan, who was a slave. Khabbab radiyan, who was a slave. Suhaib radiyan, who was not from the Quraysh. He was not from, his, even his Arabic was messed up. So people didn't respect them. And when they saw them around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Quraysh, they played a political move. You know, the kuffar, they always tried to make any tricks. So they told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we want to listen to your da'wah. We want to hear what you have to say. But how can we, as the chiefs of Quraysh, be sitting with the likes of Bilal and Suhaib and Khabbab? It's, and it's disgraceful for us. So if you want us to listen to your da'wah, remove them from your company. Take them away from you. And then we'll listen to you. And it was obviously a trick. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he has that zeal for da'wah. He wants his people, his people to hear his message. So he's about to, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns it. And the ulama have mentioned different ayat. Four of them that they said were revealed in, in, in condemning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and telling him, no, you cannot leave these people. That these are the people that Allah chose. 
And we see I mean, later on with Abbas wa Tawalla as well in the case, the same type of thing. But what does it tell you? That these du'afa, these people who are seen as weak, poor, I and mean, without social standing, were loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah honored them. Allah revealed Quran, Quranic ayat about them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as we'll talk about later, he will honor them. Plus we'll talk about it now because I already mentioned it. Huh? Later on, in Medina, after the Hijrah, and we'll talk about the Hijrah, after the Hijrah, at a time when Abu Sufyan was still not Muslim, he came to Medina to talk about the treaty between the Mushrikeen of Quraysh and the Muslims. And of course, as a guest and as somebody who they were giving da'wah to, to call towards Islam, they treated him properly as Muslims should. When Suhaib Radianu saw Abu Sufyan, who was a mushrik at the time, he said some harsh words. He said that the, the swords of Allah have not reached or they will reach the necks of the enemies of Allah. He said very harsh thing to Abu Sufyan. So Abu Bakr Radian told him to Suhaib Radianu, look, are you speaking such harshly? to a shaykh yani from the leaders of Quraysh. Like, you know, we're having him as a guest speak, speak properly to him. Don't use such hard words for him. When Abu Bakr went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and told him, Rasulullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him that if this man, Suhaib, and who was around him, Bilal and radiyallahu and others, are upset with you, Allah will be upset with you. If they become upset with you, Allah will be upset with you. Abu Bakr radiyan started to shake. He always feared Allah. He always feared not, not upsetting Allah. So he ran back to Suhaib Radianu and the Sahaba that were with him. And he told them, Ya Ikhwan, oh my brothers, did I upset you? They said, no, you didn't. He said, I apologize if anything I said harsh. They said, no, you didn't. He said, Wallahi, I don't want to say any word that will be harsh or upsetting to you because your pleasure is Allah's pleasure. Rasulullah sallallahu told me that if you are displeased with me, if you get upset with me, Allah will be upset with me. So you look at the honor that Allah gave to those that society didn't give honor to. When Allah loves you, and when Rasul loves you, when the malaika love you, and the mu'minun love you, the rest doesn't matter. And if Allah loves you for sure, the believers will love you. They'll be those that have hasan. They'll be munafiqun. They'll be hypocrites. They'll be kuffar. They'll be people that hate you. They'll be people that have their own issues. But whoever's heart is clean will love you. And that's why the love of Allah is what you should always work towards getting. So Hayb radiallahu anhu, he was from the people that wanted to follow the Prophet والسلام, everywhere and anywhere. Strict on the sunnah. When Rasulullah sallallahu performed the hijrah, so Hayb radiallahu could not bear being in Mecca without the Prophet so he wanted to make the hijrah, he wanted to migrate to Medina. And at that time, the Quraysh had put spies around him. That if he tries to get out, we'll grab him and we'll tie him up. And this is the thing with the kuffar, right? they don't let you live either way. If you want to just stay and worship your religion, they're not happy. If you want to leave, they're not happy. <laughs> so here, the mushrikeen of Mecca, they put spies around him. But he was very intelligent. So at night, he went out. To, to where they would go for qada al haja They didn't have like toilets in the house. So they would go outside to an area to go to the bathroom. So he went out and came back and then rushed back out, then came back, then rushed back out as if he had like, you know, uh, stomach problems. So the mushrikeen, they said, Lot and Uzza have cursed him with diarrhea. You know? they, didn't, they didn't realize that he was playing them, right? And every time they think as if they're, they're wooden and, and stone idols have some kind of power, you know. So they said, Khalas, you know, he's going to be running back and forth, let's go to sleep. So they went to sleep, he left. When he left, they figured out that he left, they chased him. And the Quraysh, what they would do is they would get their best riders and their fastest camels and horses and they would get weaponed up and they would chase you down. And they knew the desert well. So as he was going to Medina, they caught up to him. So Hayb al-Rumi was by himself, one man. And there were many different books of tarikh give different numbers, but the point is there were many of them. 
Now, he told them, look, I have a lot of arrows. Some of the kutub, Ibn Sa'ad, he says that he had a hundred arrows with him. He said, I have a hundred arrows, so if you guys come at me, I'm going to shoot you, and by the will of Allah, I don't miss. So the first hundred that come are all going to be taken out. And then I got a sword. And you know that I know how to handle a sword. So then I'll fight you until my sword breaks. So none of you will get to me. And if you get to me, so many of you will be dead. Is what's it, what's it worth to you? So the Quraysh, they told him, look, we don't care about you. But you came to Mecca as a broke man. As a man with nothing, a slave. And you made money. And now you're going to take that money with you. So Suhaib Radian, he was shocked. He said, that's all you care about is money? And that's when you realize the mindset of kufr is just a mindset of dunya. It's all about money. You get that boycott going, suddenly they change their mind. You know, I was in Qatar. I'm just going to do a little side message. During the FIFA. And I was with some people, some of you brothers may have met, that were from the royal family of Qatar. And they were involved in the organization of the World Cup. And they said, you know, the United Kingdom, Germany and France, they, they objected to the government of Qatar saying that you must allow the LGBTQ XYZ flags and, and all that during the, the World Cup or we're going to pull out. And the government of Qatar and, and, and the people that were organizing, the brother told me himself, he said the message they sent back from the Amir of Qatar was, if you want to pull out, go ahead. We're not, gonna, we're not going to compromise our principles. We're not going to accept what you want to do. You can pull out. But by the way, if you do pull out, the next day, we're going to give a royal decree that the citizens of Qatar are going to sell all their properties in London, in Bonn, in Paris. Good luck with your economy. <laughs> and suddenly, oh, no problem. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll send our team. Yeah, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> it's all about that money. Yeah. So here, Suhaib al-Rumi told him, this is what you want? Khalas. You can have all my wealth, all that I saved in the whole time that I did business in Mecca, all the tijara, I will tell you where that wealth is and you can have it all. And when you take it, you keep it, all I want to do is make hijrah to Allah and His Messenger. All I want to do is migrate for Allah and to go be with the Messenger of Allah, leave me. I don't care about my wealth. And the people were a people of their word at that time, the Arab from the good qualities they had, is they kept their word. So they went back, they let him go. Even though, I mean, he could have tricked them. But they knew he was a man of his word. So they left him, and he made his hijrah with nothing. And they went back, and he told them, in my house, in this corner, under this wall, this much is there, and he told them everything. And when they dug it up, it was there. And they got the money, but he got his hijrah. And here... While he is on his way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals ayat in the Qur'an that we read today about him. And this is from the miracles of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. That this conversation nobody knew about. There wasn't, and it's not, he didn't tweet it out, he didn't put it on Instagram on his timeline, and he, nobody knew. But when he was coming on his way to Medina, he had not entered Medina yet. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba that Allah has revealed ayat, min nas man yashtri nafsahu ibtaga'a mardatillah that there are those from the people who buy themselves or sell themselves in the meaning here for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mujahid and Ikrama, Ikrama the great tabi'i and mufassir, he says that this was about Suhaib al-Rumi. That he bought himself, meaning he bought his freedom by giving up his wealth for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, he was now with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. And he was always with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would accompany the Prophet alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he had narrated many ahadith that he heard from the Prophet alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we find his aqwal being quoted by the ulama of fuqaha and others, even though may not as much as Aisha radiyan and so on, but we do find that he was somebody who would take knowledge. One thing very unique about Suhaib al-Rumi is that he was very uh, close to the Sahaba and he used to love to joke. I know many of our uh, brothers and sisters want to make Islam into like something of depression, you know. Like every time you talk about Islam, you just have to be crying and you have to be depressed, but that's not what Islam is about. 
There is a time for happiness and there is a time for seriousness and there is a time to be sad and there is a time to be happy. In Islam we have that balance. In Islam we have that balance. We're not like the priests that don't marry and they, they, they put themselves with little boys and all that kind of stuff. We, we, Alhamdulillah in Islam we get married. We have children. We have jobs. We have families. We joke within bounds. Within boundaries of Sharia. We never go outside, and we shouldn't, I mean, sometimes maybe we do, but we shouldn't go outside the boundaries of the Sharia. Within that, there is nothing wrong, like Nu'man ibn Bashir radiyallahu, who is also one of the Sahaba that is well known for his jokes. Suhaib so al-Rumi, he used to joke. One of them that Imam al-Hakim has mentioned in his mustadrak, and he graded it to be Sahih, he, he had a pain in his eye. Suhaib so al-Rumi had a pain in his eye. And as we know that Foods have different effects. You know, some, as we say, have a hot effect. Some have a cold effect. Some have an effect on certain types of your body. I know a lot of these things Western medicine hasn't caught up to. But some of it has, right? Different types of, of foods will have a different effect on your body. Some foods will make an ailment worse. And some foods will make an ailment better. Like we talked about the Uqail tribe that came from outside of Medina and the milk of the camel and so on, right? So the dates he was eating had an effect that would make his eye worse. So when Rasulullah wasallam saw him eating that type of date and the, and the effects uh, that he had the infection in his eye, he told him, so hey, you're eating and you have this, this ailment in your eye. So he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm eating with my other eye. <laughs> so... Obviously, you know, when you eat something, it goes into your body, it's going to affect both eyes. But he didn't want to stop eating those dates. And he was somebody with a good sense of humor. So he joked with the Prophet ﷺ, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The hadith mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu himself laughed. And he, at, the, at the joke of Suhaib al-Rumi. There are many other jokes that he told within the bounds of Sharia. But for the sake of today, I'm not going to go into them for the sake of time. But there is a very famous hadith that is mentioned from Umar ibn Khattab radiyanhu. Umar radiyan, Suhaib radiyan were very close. Suhaib al-Rumi was very close with Umar radiyanhu. And Umar radiyan used to honor him. And used to say that he's from the early people of Islam. So one time Umar radiyan told him that uh, I would always take you above everybody except you have three faults. And this is not like really false, this is between friends. These are like a conversation between friends. He said the first you're called Abu Yahya, but you don't have a son named Yahya. And he, was kind of a, he was taking like a shot at him as a friend. He told him, secondly, you said you're Nimri, which is an Arab Qabila, but your Arabic is weak. You can't even speak Arabic well. So we know you as Rumi. You're Roman, but you say you're Arab. And you know in Sharia, you cannot give Nasab to what your Qabila is not. Meaning, for example, you know, in India and Pakistan and everything, Somebody is Hindu, they become Muslim, they said, I'm Sayyid. And he, suddenly they became from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And you're like, but your grandfather's Rajput, you know, what happened, you know? I don't know, you know? And I just, it, you know, it's interesting. I met one brother here, African-American brother. He was, uh, I don't know how he fell into the Shia uh, religion. And he was like, uh, I'm Ahlul Bayt. I was like, how long have you been Muslim? He's like, a couple of years. I was like, who's your dad? He's like, I never met the guy. How are you Ahlul Bayt? <laughs> you know, you get some people, I'm Qurashi and I'm this and I'm that, you know. You know, if you're from Quraysh, you know what you're called? No, no, like, like it's like to give nasab towards Quraysh. No, no, like Quraysh, the word Quraysh. You're not called Qurashi, it's Qurashi. In Arabic, it's Qurashi. It's not Qurashi. I've met hundreds of people, I'm Qurashi. Like, okay, if you are from Quraysh, first learn how to say it. Qurashi, it's not Qurayshi. The Arab doesn't work in Arabic, right? And, and I don't know who's left in the Arabian Peninsula. Every Sayyid I meet is either Somali or Indian or Pakistani or Afghani or, you know, and I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying you need to be careful not to give nasab to what's not your nasab because in the Sharia, that's haram. In the Sharia, that's haram. But nasab to a place can change. Meaning in the, sh in, the, in the books of hadith, you find, for example, Al-Damishqi, Thumma Al-Baghdadi. Yani many of the ulema of Jarh al Ta'adil, when you look at the biographies of ulema, you will find yani, Al-Madani, yani, even though he's not from Medina, but because he lived there. 
يعني or al Makki for example or يعني سنعني whatever and then they will say ثم بغدادي يعني because he moved to Baghdad or to Misr or so on so nothing wrong with that right that was kind of a background for them and so the third thing he said I object to you for is you spend too much money you're always spending money on people and gifts and buying and, and feeding and things you're, you're, you're very loose with spending money so now, Suhaib al-Rumi, none of these are really criticisms, right? Suhaib al-Rumi being friends with Umar, he told him that I will respond to you, but I'll respond to you all from evidences. I mean, amazing. He told him, as far as my kunya goes, it was given to me by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me, Ya Aba Yahya. So, and we signed the hadith when he came to Medina, Rasulullah called him Abu Yahya. And he said, even though I don't have a son named Yahya, but when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave me a kunya, wallahi, I'll never leave it till my death. And the way of the Arab was not always to give you a kunya after the name of your children. Like Imam al-Nabawi, what's his kunya? Abu Zakariya. Yeah? Even though he never got married. <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah, Taqiyuddin Ibn Taymiyyah, what's his kunya? Come on, guys. Abu Abbas, barakallah feek, yeah? Never got married. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have a son named Abbas, right? So, now, even if you don't have, like Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, he doesn't have a son named Bakr. Abu Huraira, huh? sometimes, the, and he, there is a Sahabi called Dhul Yadain, the one of the two arms. And he, that's, his, that's his name, you can find in books of Hadith, Dhul Yadain, right? Everybody has two hands, but, and he had long hands, so he was called Dhul Yadain. So, here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him Abu Yahya, so that's why he had the kunya. He said, secondly, well, Nasab, he said that the people called me a Rumi because I spent my time there. But my Qabila is not Rum. Ethnic, my ethnicity is not Roman. So I would never give Nasab because Rasulullah forbid for us to give Nasab other than our Nasab. So my Nasab is Arab, so I'm Arab even if my Arabic is weak. And he said, regarding spending, he said, I heard Rasulullah sallam say, this is a Sahih Hadith, he said, Khayr, Khayrukum, best of you, man at'am ta'am waraddu salam He said, the best of you are the one that gives, that feeds people, that gives people food and returns the salam. So when I heard this, I decided that I always want to be generous with feeding people, and I always make sure to return the salam. So your criticism of me feeding people and spending is not valid, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said this, Umar radiyan said that I can never respond to you. Because everything he brought, Dalil. So he said, I will never respond to you. And they were very good friends. Umar radiallahu anhu used to put Suhaib al-Rumi in front of the people. And at the time where Umar radiyan got stabbed, and this is very important, when he was attacked during Salah by Abu Lu'lu, and Firoz, the, the Mushrik, the Majusi, the fire worshipper, the one that some people build and his qabr to be a, a place of ziyara now because, I don't know, they hate Islam or something. So, when he was stabbed during salah, and he was leading salah, the coward couldn't even face him outside of salah. And now, the Muslims were in a time of turmoil because they didn't have the next khalifa selected. And Umar Radiyan, he assigned sahaba to sit down and figure out who the next khalifa will be. And from them, Uthman ibn Affan radiyanhu, from them, Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiyanhu, and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu, and others. While this was going on, who would lead the salah in Medina? The Khalifa, the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader. Now at this time, Umar radiyan cannot lead, he's injured. Who did he assign to lead the salawat? Suhaib al rumi You see how important of a person he was, and many of us didn't even know who he was until today. Many of you, we didn't know this detail about him. That Umar radiyan assigned him to lead the salah in place of the Khalifa. And do you know who led the Salatul Janazah in Umar ibn Khattab? Suhaib al-Rumi radiyan. Not Uthman ibn Affan, not Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, not Abdurrahman ibn Awf, not Abu Yudh ibn Jarrah. Suhaib al-Rumi. Umar radiyan, he asked that Suhaib al-Rumi lead his Janazah. He died at the age of 73 years in Medina and he is buried in Jannatul al -Baqi amongst many of the great Sahaba. 
I especially chose him to speak about today because one, I see many people don't know about him. You may have heard the name. You know, whenever I do a dars, after the dars, people tell me, yeah, I knew all of that. <laughs> if I ask you before the dars, then you don't remember. <laughs> but secondly, because many sahaba like Bilal radiyanhu, whose habashi was black, and Salman al-Farasi from Faras are known, but Suhaib al-Rumi was very white. In fact, the ulama of tafsir, some of them mentioned him to have blonde hair. Some even mentioned him to be a redhead. Some ulama said Suhaib coming from the meaning that he was redheaded. Whether he was a redhead or a blonde, he was very light skinned with colored eyes and so on. And Bilal Radian was black from Africa. Salman al-Farasi was Persian, not Arab. But these were the closest companions and the earliest of the people of Islam. Honored by Allah Himself in the Quran, honored by the Prophet, والسلام, honored by the Sahaba. So it shows Islam is not a religion based on ethnicity or color or lineage. Doesn't matter if you're Arab or Ajam, black or white, blonde or black haired, all that matters is how good is your aqidah, your belief, how clean is your heart. How good are your, your amal? How is your taqwa in front of Allah? That's all that's going to matter. And we hope that at least we can learn about these great sahaba and heroes of Islam. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.